What did I just watch? Okay, uh, let's see. The Congress begins with Robin Wright playing herself, agreeing to become a digitized actress. And then it's 20 years in the future and everyone's on hallucinogenic drugs that let them see each other as animated avatars. And then it's the real world again and Robin Wright is searching for her son. This is a trippy movie and I'm not at all certain that I got everything that was going on, even after looking back through Wikipedia at the plot synopsis to piece together what happened. Even at the end, I don't quite understand what was gained by making the main character a real-life actress, as it didn't seem to be important to the narrative thread at the end. I do find that French films often go over my head in terms of how they communicate their themes, and this is definitely one of those. It has some fascinating visuals, and I dig the concept as a whole, but I just couldn't track the story as it went, and so I stopped caring. I guarantee there are a lot of people who would love this, though. The Flamingo Kid stars Matt Dillon as a plumber's son who gets a job as valet and cabana boy at a ritzy summer resort, which makes him uncertain what he wants to do with his life. It's a pretty straightforward story that is rooted in some decent performances, particularly Hector Elizondo as Dillon's father, who mistrusts his son's new wealthy mentors. There's a warmth to their father-son relationship even when they're at each other's throats, and it helps provide believable stakes to Dylan's coming-of-age crisis. Much of the movie is pretty meandering, which gets a little tiresome as the movie wears on, but it does make the final scene all the more compelling when we finally get to see some action happening. That final scene goes a long way toward making the rest of the movie work, but the acting from the supporting cast helps as well. It's not an amazing movie, but if you like the characters in this setting, it'll do just fine. Annie Live was the live television production of the classic musical Annie, about a spunky orphan girl during the Great Depression and her adoption into a new wealthy family. This particular version stars newcomer Celine Smith as Annie, and a supporting cast that includes Harry Connick Jr., Taraji P. Henson, Titus Burgess, and Nicole Scherzinger. The last version of the show I saw was the 2014 film adaptation that took some serious liberties with both the music and the story, and rewatching this one reminded me how much I really hate the show. There's nothing about the pacing of the show that works for me, there's no opportunity for character development, and while the songs are catchy, I don't actually like any of them. This version in particular, though, really lacks in the performances, particularly from Smith and Connick Jr., who are both incredibly stiff and bland, bringing nothing whatsoever to the role. On the flip side, we have Henson, who is chewing the scenery like she's at an entirely different show, and while it's at least lively, it mostly doesn't work either. A messy performance of a show that needs good performances to work at all. Swing Shift features Goldie Hawn as a woman whose husband goes off to World War II. She, along with many other soldiers' wives, gets a job working in an airplane factory. And as she works there, she begins to gain some independence, grow in confidence, and make some friends she wouldn't have before, including a man she develops feelings for, played by Kurt Russell. This is a perfectly middle-of-the-road movie highlighting some interesting relationships and the changing of gender norms in the 1940s. It never hits on any of the interesting pieces quite as much as I wanted it to, but it's there. The acting is solid, the writing is decent, the cinematography is efficient. There's very little exciting about this, which is kind of disappointing, but there's also not that much to complain about either. For anyone particularly interested in this time period, it's probably worth checking out. Pink Floyd The Wall is a musical based on the Pink Floyd album The Wall. It loosely follows the story of a young musician dealing with trauma, mental illness, and substance abuse. I should probably start this review saying I've never really been a fan of Pink Floyd's music. Their songs always feel like atmospheric soundscapes rather than music, which I'm just less interested in listening to. But turns out that works kind of perfectly when paired with intriguing visuals hinting at a story. This is definitely a case of the whole working better for me than the sum of its parts. The images and the sounds help to make sense of each other, and together they create an experience I like much, much better than if I'd been dealing with either separately. They work so well as a whole, I have difficulty identifying individual moments that worked for me, but the experience overall was powerful and intense, and I kind of loved it. This is definitely one to add to my list to revisit in the near future, but I found it very emotionally moving on a first watch, and I'm delighted to have found a way into a band I don't usually care for. Little Nikita stars River Phoenix as a teenager whose parents have a secret past, and Sidney Poitier as the FBI agent determined to expose them. I'm hesitant to say much more, because despite how awkwardly the story unfolds with its secrets, I do think it doesn't want us to know them all until about halfway through, so I'll, I'll leave it there. This is a pretty clunky one. The writing is awkward, the acting is wooden from some very good performers, the story plays out with big dramatic moments that aren't at all justified in-universe. With just a little bit more editing and finesse, this could have been a pretty fun coming-of-age thriller, but it's just all done so clumsily that none of it really works. 
The one thing I do want to give a nod to, however, is the musical score, which almost convinced me a couple times that the movie is better than it actually is. Aside from that, however, it's a strange and poorly executed thriller that completely wastes the talent of its actors, director, and writer, all of whom have made much better movies. Hell's Angels is a 1930 war epic, following two English brothers going to fight in the World War. They could not be more different. Roy is conscientious and careful, while Monty is reckless and hedonistic. Monty's behavior consistently gets him in trouble, with Roy having to clean up after him. Usually I find epic length movies to be unnecessarily long, rarely with a justified runtime, but I really appreciated all the different ways we saw our protagonists interact with each other and the world around them. It really helped flesh them out in a way that made the film's ending sit a lot more powerfully. There's also some very creative early use of color here. While most of the film is in black and white, there are some dramatically tinted battle scenes as well as a full color scene at an extravagant party, and they really use their deliberate color choices to convey a sense of mood and tone. Even the battle scenes here, which I would usually be bored by, are used effectively to communicate our protagonist's stories, and it all works together really well. Definitely one I'd recommend checking out. Petite Maman follows an eight-year-old girl who is staying with her parents in her late grandmother's house as they clean it out. She ends up wandering the nearby woods and making friends with another little girl, only to discover they have a surprising connection. It's not really much of a spoiler, but the movie itself doesn't make it wholly obvious what their connection is until later, so I'll leave it vague here. The film is very short, at just 72 minutes, and the result is a simple, sweet fantasy story about two little girls' friendship. Sisters Josephine and Gabrielle Sanz play the two girls, and they have a very natural camaraderie together that really brings the story to life. They're delightful to watch interact, and as their bigger story unwinds, it just piggybacks on that delightfulness. It's hard to come up with much more to say about it without going into details that I think probably work best if you don't know about them beforehand, but it's well worth a watch. Reaching for the Moon is a 1930 romance about a wealthy man falling in love on a cruise. That's about all I can tell you, because this movie has not survived well. And I mean that in the sense that apparently most surviving versions of this movie are just over 60 minutes, roughly two thirds of its original runtime. I'd like to blame the general aimlessness and awkwardness of the plot on that, because there are some good moments. Douglas Fairbanks as our lead makes the most of his physicality, jumping and leaping around the space, often for no apparent reason at all, but it's engaging nonetheless. And we also get one song performed by a very young Bing Crosby. Apparently this was originally a musical, but most of the songs got cut as musicals became less popular. But as a romance, or really narrative of any kind, the story is thin and confusing. It definitely seems to be missing portions that would help us connect the dots on the plots and the characterization. Of course it's possible that the 30 cut minutes didn't elaborate on that any further, but I'd like to give this film the benefit of the doubt, so I'll pretend that half hour would fix everything. Hustle stars Adam Sandler as a basketball scout who finds himself at odds with the new owner of the team he works for. He's under a lot of pressure to find the next big star, but when he thinks he's found him in a single father named Bo Cruz, the new owner is reluctant to take him up on it. So he gambles on the player himself, spending his own money to bring Cruz to the United States and get him noticed by the pros. The movie centers heavily around not only the logistical goal of getting Cruz into the NBA, but also around the paternal relationship Sandler develops with the young man. And as a whole, that storyline works. Sandler's usual abrasiveness is channeled here into a fiercely protective attitude toward the people he cares about, and it works much better for me than most of his performances, even his serious ones. Like so many sports dramas, the beats feel familiar, but that's not so much a knock on the movie. It hits those beats well and satisfyingly. A solid flick. Marcel the Shell with Shoes On is a full-length version of the 2010 viral short of the same name, starring the voice of Jenny Slate as a curious, philosophical little shell named Marcel, who has shoes and a face. In this story, Marcel and his nana Connie live together in the house where they used to live with a larger community of shells, who were accidentally taken out of the house when one of the former occupants moved out. We followed them and their documentarian Dean as they go about their days in the house. Marcel was a viral sensation when this short video was released, and watching this reminded me why. He's a truly charming character, simultaneously bold and shy in an incredibly relatable way. And of course, the design of these characters is adorable. The film does exactly what it should, just lets this character be this character. Even as the plot gets a little thicker and we have a more serious narrative arc playing out, there are still so many moments of just watching Marcel interact with his world, and that makes the more emotionally poignant moments really land. This was a delightful surprise. I found myself very taken with this film. Billy the Kid is a 1930 telling of the story of Billy the Kid and Pat Garrett, the sheriff hunting him down. 
This version, as noted in an opening title card written by the then governor of New Mexico, takes some liberties with the story, though the title card also says it captures the spirit of the character. This particular chapter of the story follows Billy trying to avenge his boss's death, while Garrett tries to get enough evidence to bring him in. Billy is played by Johnny Mac Brown and Garrett by Wallace Beery, and the two of them are absolutely the most interesting part of a pretty uneven film. Brown brings a flirty playfulness to the role, and this is probably my favorite performance from Beery, who has shown up quite a few times throughout my 1930 project. Here they are good foils for each other in their tone, and the most engaging scenes are when they are connecting. A lot of the film, though, focuses on a dull romance between Billy and a recently widowed young woman, or on the other outlaws trying to bring Billy down, and that part is a lot less interesting. Juno and the Paycock is a very early Alfred Hitchcock, before he became known primarily for thrillers. This story is a straight-up melodrama about a poor Irish family who learn they are coming into some money that would change everything, but then things take a downward turn. If I hadn't known this was Hitchcock, I wouldn't have been able to identify it as being directed by anyone notable. It feels very much in line with the many other family melodramas I've been watching from 1930. There's an interesting amount of time paid in the center of the film to the family celebrating their good fortune and singing, like I think we get three full songs. And while it's easy to view that as being a bit of a waste of time, I can see how Hitchcock is trying to set us up for the family's downfall by highlighting their celebration. It doesn't fully work, but it's an interesting choice. The cinematography is also full of intriguing close-ups, which certainly don't look realistic, but do a good job of highlighting the larger-than-life nature of the story. Definitely worth watching as an early film from a talented director, but doesn't necessarily fully stand on its own. Hand Rolled Cigarette tells the story of a retired soldier who finds himself sheltering a young man on the run from some vengeful drug dealers, and the two form a reluctant bond. The introduction of this movie focuses on a group of soldiers needing to find new paths in life after the Hong Kong Military Service Corps is dissolved. And that was an interesting intro, as it was something I have very little knowledge of and I was interested to learn about. But the movie doesn't explore that aspect very much and just turns the story into a typical neo-noir crime thriller, which was a disappointing downturn. The movie leans heavily into the grungy neo-noir visuals I find not only unappealing, but often difficult to parse, and I had trouble tracking the many different characters crossing paths in the story. The beginning and the end hold together as individually strong moments, but I was less than enthused with most of the middle. Maybe worth a watch for those inclined to enjoy the genre, but otherwise, you can skip it. Summer Holiday is a 1960s road trip musical romantic comedy about a group of four young mechanics who decide to take a London double-decker bus on vacation across Europe, picking up various hitchhikers along the way who change their course. This is absolutely the perfect example of a light, breezy 60s musical, with lots of entertaining song and dance numbers and a plot that never tries to get in the way of them. Some of these numbers are better than others, of course, and there's an extended pantomime sequence that doesn't work for me at all, but the majority of it works really well. I love the zaniness of jumping from one new hitchhiker to the next, as well as the sudden appearance of a plot to sabotage their journey, and our bus drivers have such a cheery attitude to every mishap that befalls them that it maintains that bright, sunny feel over the whole movie. The visuals are nice too, some beautifully vivid costume and set design that helps bolster even the least inspiring tunes. It's not the best musical of this era, but it might be one of the most musicals of this era, and it was exactly what I wanted to watch on the day I watched it. Scent of a Woman stars Al Pacino as a gruff, retired military man who has lost his eyesight, and Chris O'Donnell as the young prep school student hired to keep an eye out for him while Pacino's family is on vacation. But as soon as the family leaves, Pacino is off on an adventure to New York City, where he intends to enjoy all his favorite things in life before taking his own. This movie jumped back and forth for me between being really effective and being really cheesy. O'Donnell makes a likable protagonist, and Pacino is certainly giving it his all, but he's most compelling here when he's at his quietest, and that's not very often. I get that his character's obnoxious loud bluster is in fact an essential part of the character, but I find it very unpleasant to watch. The last third works best for me, if feeling a little unearned. I get why people loved this, but I could never latch on to the character or its portrayal enough to be fully sold on it. 